No one say anything. <laughs> no. Don't. <laughs> Don't tell him your name. Yes. Your name will also go on the list. What is it? <laughs> Don't tell him, Pike. <laughs> I'm probably the only one that remembers that. Oh, good, good Lord. No, I, I love, love that show. Yeah. I couldn't stand it, actually, but that was the one bit that I thought was hilarious. You couldn't stand it? Yeah, and it was like, I don't know, I think it was because it was one of those things that my, my dad used to like it, so oh. I therefore had an aversion to it, because, you know, uh, you, kind of, you rebel yeah. against anything that, oh, there's a there's a producer John in the house. <gasps> oh, where did, hello. Where did he appear from? Oh, hang on, we are air, we are on air, sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's just me at the moment, so we can't see anyone <laughs> apart from me. <laughs> at all. Um, shall, I, shall I plug in the wire? Yes, please. Oh, oh, oh hello. <laughs> uh, one moment. Where is, where is the hell? Okay. I can do this while, um, hang on, there we go, yes, I, I can see Nev looking at the clock, it's alright, I'm aware, <laughs> there we go, right, okay, do 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 do, okay, uh, <laughs> Do, do, do. Um, okay. Okay, right, there we go. Uh, uh, right, so that should. Is that working for everyone? Yes, it is. Excellent. Jolly good. Join. Excellent. Uh, I can't hear, but that's that's all right. That's fine. I'll work that out in a second. No, it should be okay. I can bring it up a tiny bit if everybody needs. Uh, I have um. Okay. All right. I'll leave it alone. I won't touch a button. Very good. Very clear today. Bloody. It's really clear today. Yeah. It sounds like. Yeah. Like, really. Ah, uh, you've got a new boxy thing. Right, okay, so uh, let me do this so that I'm not uh, losing the, what, the what's it, and I'll do that. There we go. Say hello, Nev. Hello. <laughs> <How's> that? <laughs> that was lovely. Can you do that again? That was beautifully camp. Well done, dear. <laughs> <laughs> you need some uh, earphones in, Carlos? Yeah, I'm just finishing off this email. Right, then. I have um, an ongoing support ticket open with ATR at the moment regarding my microphone. Oh. Um, it's now been tested on four different laptops. Right. As working or not working? Not working. Oh, well, that's good. <laughs> um, and discovered a video on YouTube about a guy that had the same issue as me, and it mm. turned out that he opened it up and there was a loose wire inside. So okay. I don't I'm open getting... it up. I'd let them do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. If yeah. it comes to that, then that's kind of what I'm hoping is that yeah, they'll yeah. say, send it back. Um, yeah. Uh, or they might... Yeah, it's just... It just you can plug it in. And it, it, uh, one it, minute, by the way. One, it, uh, one minute to clock. The LED comes on, so it's receiving USB power, but it's not being recognized by the device manager or by windows or whatever and it's mm. you know it doesn't make the little bongy noise that you normally get if you yeah. if you plug a mouse or something in. Yeah. mine doesn't do it. i think you yeah. turned off my bingy bongs on my I on did, this yes. yeah yes. yeah <laughs> uh 30 seconds to clock <laughs> how technical is that my bingy bongs it's brilliant i've never been more proud <laughs> of you uh <laughs> oh. Life wouldn't be life without a bingy bong. Well, quite. Bingy bong to you two. Um, and... Bringing up YouTube. Oh, there we go. Okay. You know, if my um, internet's a bit weird this evening, my, my sound is very... Okay. Don't know what to do with that. No, I don't. It's, it's either 
slow internet or, or laptop, I suspect. Right, just switching to output for a moment. La, 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 la. Okay, here we go then. Good luck, everyone. Seatbelts fastened. Yes. Tray tables in their upright position. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three. And a very warm welcome indeed to episode number 494 of the Plain Talking UK podcast. I'm Carlos, and in this week's pack show, we are playing Boeing Bingo. There's a retiring DCA, and we have a great story about the return of flying boats. And we've had a very busy week for mishaps, so we have a complete roundup of everything that's happened this week. Over in the world of grey stuff, we've got news about the old Buckingham Air Show here in the UK, autonomous F-16s, and some Swiss Tigers. So, joining me this week across the uh, village here uh, of Bungie in Suffolk is, of course, Matt Smith. Hello, 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 hello. How are we all? Good, good, good. I haven't seen you this week, Smith. No, you've, you've no. Been, you've been aloof. It's been the other way around this time. You've had time and I've not this week. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's it's been rare. a bit mad. Yeah, been, it's been a bit... Uh, yeah, things are all a bit full on at the moment. I'm a little bit behind mm. with, uh, with some of my work, so having to put a little overtime in, which is very much a swear word in my world these days. <laughs> oh, blimey. I know, I know. I haven't done that for years. No, I know, I know. Yes, I mean, you barely do any work during the day, I'm not going to lie. Oi! <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're not going to talk about my well-appointed kitchen either. No, indeed. Anyway. What was that about a, 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 a toasty maker? <laughs> I'm sure I heard rumours about that. No, no. Oh, you've no. got to eat well. You've got to eat well. Well, quite, absolutely. Yeah, no, and that, also... That's my problem. I do eat well. <laughs> <laughs> Feeling hungry now. Yes, yes. And also joining us in his glorious production studio in the sprawling Buckinghamshire countryside is, of course, our connoisseur of all things BA in seat 1A. It's Neville Bounds. Yes, good evening, folks. Hope everybody is well. Um, yeah, hectic week so far. I uh, spent a couple of days down in Brighton at, uh, for our quarterly business review. Always a exciting time and always a challenging time because if we haven't done the number, then people get cross and they you know we, we get <laughs> told about it uh so uh that's very good uh, over at colchester earlier on as well so oh. almost over your side of the uh neck of the woods um a bit, a bit of road works going on on the a12 i noticed oh, so, uh, of course they are 40 miles an hour speed limit so yeah. that's not good um and uh yeah so no it's been a hectic week so far uh, it's gone very quickly as well i can't believe it's wednesday already so yeah amazing really well, yeah, good to see you, Nev, and uh, I'm guessing you've you've had the wind like we have, not literally, but like we have here on the east coast of the UK. Well, Sky yeah, winds. the weekend was horrific, wasn't it? Um, I think it was Sunday, uh, Saturday and Sunday were the, the worst days, uh, but uh, yeah, very, very, uh, very blustery, but uh, yes, that's uh, died down a bit now, I'm pleased to say. Yes, indeed, and joining us as well uh, this evening uh, across... Uh, well, he's, a, he's, he's very much down south, in the lovely part of the UK, uh, down in towards Devon, is, of course, Nick. Evening, Carlos. Hi, everyone. And, uh, yeah, nice to be back on. Uh, good to see everyone. So, uh, sorry to hear about your wind problems there, Nick. Oh. hope that's uh, settling down. <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've been, it's actually been uh, quite fun with all this weather, having a bit of... Uh, some nice live streams from Manchester and Heathrow over the last couple of days. It's, uh, it's been quite fun watching those. Some interesting sporty landings going on. Sporty, like that. Sporty, <laughs> yes, very sporty landings. More on about that actually later on. We've got a good few video or videos or two to show you on the show from some interesting takeoffs actually uh, this week. But uh, Armando cannot join us this week. He, surprise, surprise, he's flying. I think, actually, I think he is actually, yeah, I think he's actually in the air now. 
uh, flying, so he can't be with us uh, this evening. But he has sent us in a little video uh, just to say hello to all you glorious YouTube and uh, audio listeners of the show. So, Matt, hit the button. Hey, team. Uh, obviously, as you can tell, I'm not going to be on the show today. Um, what I tried to do today was fly during the eclipse. So today on April 8th, uh, we had what was supposed to be 80% uh, eighty percent obscuration of the sun here in Charlotte, North Carolina. My idea was to go fly, um, fly through the eclipse. It was a big old nothing burger. Man, it didn't even, it got a little dusky as my wife said. And that was about it. The only eclipse that's happening is just skydivers falling from the sky covering the sun as they are falling to the ground but um, i tried to record a little video but can't actually see anything different so um, here we are the guys have a great show i'm sure uh, we're nearing in on the 500th got some cool announcements coming but uh yeah i hope you guys have a great show um, i'm actually not flying this thing today when this airs out i'll be uh, in the Hawker going up to Minnesota again. So y'all have a great show and we'll catch you later. Oh, so cool. Honestly. So so many people as, as well as our very own Sturman, who's in the chat room normally would love to have a go in that aircraft. Oh really? Yeah, it didn't. It, it didn't do anything for me at all. I mean, it was a beautiful looking aircraft. Don't get me wrong. And I have, <laughs> I'm one of very few who have been very lucky enough to see it in the flesh. Not, um, it wasn't officially Armando's at that point. Uh, to be fair, but uh, yeah, I mean, it was a beaut. It's a beautiful looking aircraft. Uh, I'm not sure I would have. I would not sure I could fly in it. Not yet, maybe. What about you? What about you now? A bit of open cockpit flying. Would that? Would that sort no, of I have you? to say it's not my, not really my kind of thing. No. <laughs> so I know that sounds disappointing, but it's just yeah. not something I really want to do. I, I, I'm with you on that one. Never 100. percent I think. Um, oh. You know, I, I know, I know. You know, it's. Just, I don't know. I don't know what it is. I'm. I'm, I'm not great about. But yeah, yeah. I'll tell you what, if we, if we said, you know, to our listeners, there's a chance you can go down there today and have a go with Armando and the biplane, I'm sure we'd have a queue of people waiting for huh. a go, I expect. Yeah, I'm at the front of that queue. Just um, so. Nick's right, at the front okay. of the queue. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I was going to say... I suspect Producer John would also... Uh, would oh, he say, would. Yeah, yeah. yeah, uh, I'm, yeah. I'm bigger than him. Right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. He's, um, yes. Uh, uh, we do have a Producer John with us today, which is... Uh, so if we do go suddenly silent, because we've not had him for a while, we're so not used to him talking in our ears anymore. If we do stop talking, you'll know why. <laughs> Hello, hello, John. Yeah, all right. He's just checking. Yeah, Joe. he's just checking in. <laughs> so we're going to say a big hello to everyone who's joined us in the YouTube chat room this evening. Kicking off at the top of the list here, we've got Alan White. Hello to you, Alan. Good to see you in there. Uh, Neville Barnes is obviously wielding his blue spanner of doom, keeping an eye on all those naughty oh, people who good. might drop in. Uh, Richard Adams is in as well. Good to see you. Captain Cruz is also there. Dirk S. Hello, Dirk. Uh, Hobby Time as well. Richard E. Flagg. Good to see you in there. Uh, Bill, he's in there. He's He was ready and waiting for you to push that button, Matt. He was. Bill was. He was, yeah. yes. Uh, Tanya. Hello to Tanya. The lovely Tanya. Good to see you in there. Nana's in there as well. Hello to you. We've got Darren Smith. Hello, Darren. Uh, good to see you as well. John Falk. Hello, John. He's only there briefly because supper beckons. He's going off for his Fair supper. Fair enough. Absolutely. I don't blame you. Uh, food is always priority in my world. <laughs> the lovely Masha as well is also in there. She says, good evening, everyone. Hello, Masha. Lovely to see you in there. Uh, Neil Bryden's in there. Good to see you, Neil. Good to see you in there. We've got, uh, who else we've got? I'm scrolling down the list. John Jester. Hello, John. Our resident uh, cargo captain is there. Good to see you, John. And if we scroll down, make sure I don't miss anyone else. Uh, no, I don't think I've missed anyone, in case anyone pops in. But welcome to everyone who's joined us on the YouTube stream today. Don't forget, if you are an audio listener and you want to see how gorgeous we all look on uh, video, then check us out on YouTube. Just look for Playing Talking UK. Or don't. Or don't. Don't feel obliged. Don't. No need. <laughs> click on the subscribe <laughs> button and the bell icon to be notified when Matt has pressed that live and broadcast button on the big computer in the studio on the so big got... computer in the studio well i could say bigs because <laughs> there are a lot of computers in that studio 
It's just two computers. Forever. There are two a computers few. in this studio. And the laptops oh, and the screens. There's only one laptop in here. I think. Oh, no, there yeah. is two, actually. Cutting no, I'll take it it's back. cutting down. It's yeah, cutting absolutely. down. absolutely. I can't afford the electric anymore, mate. <laughs> yeah. So we've got loads to get through on the show tonight, including our caption this, which is back this week. And we've got Ooh. another great interview as well uh, from Dublin. And we've also got uh, the return again this week of our new segment on the show, our retro aviation commercial, a Ooh. commercial break, which this week we're going back to 1980. So that's coming up later. Lovely. So, commercial news time. Are you, everyone ready? Uh, I, 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 I think so. Let's go. The captain has turned on the seatbelt light. Please take your seats and fasten your seatbelts. Now, in answer to Neil's uh, question in the chat room, it was November 2013 is the answer to that question. Uh, first off, in the commercial news this week, it's uh, bbc.co.uk, this is, and uh, it's, we're back to those liquids again, Nev. I mean, honestly, you go through enough airports, it must frustrate you to the point of... Oh, I've got used to it now. Just as they're about to change the rules. I now. know. So major airports are to be allowed to miss the latest deadline for installing scanners to end the 100 milliliter liquid limit. But London Gatwick, Heathrow and Manchester are all expected to miss the 1st of June rollout date, the BBC understands. Department for Transport said the delays were for genuine reasons. Okay, uh, Airports have had to apply individually for year-long extensions which could mean passengers may have to continue removing liquids and laptops out of hand luggage until june 2025 some smaller airports have met the deadline including luton london city and teesside the civil aviation authority will impose financial penalties on airports that keep missing deadlines the dft said the rules requiring liquids to be taken through security in containers of 100 mil or less in a clear plastic bag were introduced back in 2006 after a plot to bomb a transatlantic flight was foiled the new scanners use CT X-ray technology to provide 3D images so air items can be left inside bags and liquids up to 2 litres will be permitted. They're also already used in some other countries including the US, although ministers claim the UK is the first in the world to attempt such a wide-scale rollout. Airports were originally told to bring in the new scanners by 2022 before the deadline was moved to June this year. Problems cited by airports include supply chain issues, the need for major construction to be carried out in order to have the scanners installed. X-ray machines, similar to CT scanners used in hospitals, are very heavy and in some instances floors will need to be reinforced. Karen D, Chief Executive of the Airport Operators Association Trade Body, said, as with any programme of this complexity, there are significant challenges and we are happy to the government that has recognised these and agreed to extend the timeframes for delivery when necessary. London Heathrow and Gatwick and Manchester are all expected to need more time to finish installing the new equipment across their lanes and London City and Teesside International Airports meanwhile are the first two to install the scanners across all their security lanes and switch to the new liquids rule in April of this year. Uh, last year. Uh, a source pointed out that Heathrow has 146 security lines. Really, Nev? Uh, more than any other UK airport, and the installation process has to be carefully managed to avoid hindering the flow of passengers. Chris Woodroof, Managing Director, uh, Director at Manchester Airport, recently told the BBC the vast majority of airports in the UK will still be in the process of switching out their scanners, just like we will be, he said. So our message to passengers is please do come with your liquids in a bag less than 100 millilitres and make sure you're ready to take your laptops out. And if you turn up and you happen to be in one of the new lanes we have in this terminal, then that's great, he said. 
Passengers have also been advised to check the rules on liquids and devices at their destination or transfer airports before they fly in case the rules are still in place there. Teesside Managers Director Phil Forster told the BBC as today's programme that he sympathised with the problems of larger airports having and fitting these new units. Clearly they are very expensive machines, he said, and very heavy machines. So I know that airports are looking at the weight of the flooring because some of the new security services are on different different floors. He said that we are in a very fortunate position because of being a smaller regional airport, we don't have as many security lanes and the vast amount of work needed to reconfigure. Now, Nev, have you had the chance to fly through an airport that's got one of these new super duper scanners in yeah yes several um london city i did uh also skipple where i got shouted at in fact everybody got shouted at uh because it wasn't particularly clear about whether you should leave your laptops and um stuff in or not uh, so there's a bit of bit of bad language there um but of course um heathrow the first wing at terminal five they have just uh, equipped their facility uh, with these machines um and in fact the, the whole facility was shut for three months that security bit uh, that you and i went through carlos uh, because uh, of the floor loading of these machines is extremely heavy uh, so they've had to do reinforced flooring uh, just to uh, accommodate them hopefully though uh, this is a bit of short-term pain for the long-term benefits uh, but I was noticing that T5 the other day was quite a lot of uh, additional baggage screening and checking going on. So let's see what happens. I'm back there on Tuesday off to Edinburgh for a couple of days. Um, so I shall report back next week. So I'm guessing these machines are bigger now, Valley. Have you seen? Yeah, Huge. Okay. And but extremely heavy as well. Uh, that's the other thing. So, um, but um, no, I mean, as I say, I, I'm hoping that this is just going to be a bit of a short term bit of problem. But of course, the thing is, when you're coming back from your destination airport, uh, you'll be back in the uh, the bags and you know the, the small amounts mm. of liquid again because not all of the facilities, uh, sorry, not all of the airports have this facility yet. So, uh, and of course, when it says uh, that airports will be fined, I wonder who will be paying for that. Then um, I think my us. The punters, probably. London Heathrow. Yes, I, I have that as well, actually. Um, that happened before um, these machines were installed at T, the T5 first wing as well. Um, so, but uh, yeah, it's. Well, let, let's hope that it, it gets solved because, again, it's another. Um, limiting factor about how to get on an aircraft and we've had enough about that in the last few weeks haven't we so yeah can i am i only one who noticed that they'd, they'd missed one airport out on that on that whole story that is quite a busy airport in the uk stansted not beckles no Stansted is not mentioned on there. I just no, couldn't help noticing that. Oh, okay. A bit of report in the chat room that we, we can't hear Nick, says Dirk S, or Matt. So I don't know if there's some technical business going on there somewhere. Okay, try that. That probably helps. Oh. Yeah, Nick, Nick's on mute anyway. Yeah. yeah. All okay. right. Well, no, that's a technical <laughs> problem. I'm still there. Yeah, no, sorry. <laughs> I, 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 I had the wrong fader up. Oh. <laughs> I've solved that now. Yeah. I've I'll try not to take it personally. Yeah. Indeed, no, fair enough. Uh, yes, uh, just quick, just a sort of rough thing. Basically, we're saying, uh, uh, well, D Darren had a couple of messages. Uh, one of which was, I went through one of these scanners in Terminal Two at LHR. You have uh, to empty your pockets, everything including tissues. Uh, and then Alan White was saying uh, that it's shocking. T two, and um, um, not that one. Uh, the, but yeah, the bags go through quickly. Now people are stopped to find a hanky in their shirt pocket. <laughs> I must admit, a few uh, was it last year when I went flew out wherever I, went, I think it was that was probably the US. I think it was when I flew out there. I forgot to take my wallet out of my back pocket, and that was frowned upon. Oh really? Yeah, I had to go through the um, the the door, the beep beep, beep door. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. Well, I, I have that because it's like um, it's like if you're wearing jeans or something like that, isn't it? It's the same sort of problem. It, it uh, I completely it's... forgot. I yeah. I normally take it out and put it in the tray along with yeah. the uh, with the case and stuff. I completely forgot. Yeah, that, they didn't didn't find that impressive. No. So. Uh, Nev, you've got uh, the next story all about, um, well, Russia. 
Yes, I do like the way some of these stories are written, and, and the first paragraph of this uh, will, will summarise it. It's on the aerotime.aero, and it says that two Russian nationals based in the United States, open brackets, US, close brackets, have pleaded guilty after they were caught acquiring and unlawfully exporting controlled aviation technology to Russian end users. Uh, Oleg Sergeyevich Patsula and Vasily Sergeyevich Besedin, who live in Miami-Dade County, Florida, both admitted to conspiring to violate the U.S. Export uh, Control Reform Act, which is uh, ECRA, uh, whilst uh, Patsula also pleaded guilty to conspiring to commit international money laundering. Uh, from May 2022 to May 2023, the two men obtained orders for various aircraft parts and components from Russian buyers, primarily commercial airline companies. They then sourced the parts from the US supplies and unlawfully exported the materials to Russia while circumventing export laws and regulations that were put in place following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The defendants admitted to knowing the items were controlled and requiring a license from the Department of commerce uh, to export. Uh, in one example, they conspired to export multiple shipments of a carbon disc brake system used on Boeing 737 aircraft. Uh, the accused provided false information that the parts were intended for countries other than Russia, such as Turkey. US authorities were able to detain prior to export multiple shipments made by the defendants containing units of the brake assembly technology. The defendants also made false statements both orally to one supplier and in the export compliance forms for parts where money was received from a Russian airline company to make the purchase. In total, US bank accounts associated with the conspiracy received at least $4,582,288 sent from Russian airline companies through Turkish bank accounts to purchase aircraft parts and components intended for unlawful export. By their own admission, the defendants fraudulently procured millions of dollars of worth of U.S. origin uh, aircraft equipment to smuggle to Russian airline companies, said uh, Assistant Attorney General Matthew Olson of the Justice Department's National Security Division. These pleas are the latest, latest example of the department's commitment to bringing to justice those whose crimes enrich the Russian regime. Conspiracy to... Uh, conspiracy conspiracy, sorry, to export items from the US without a license in violation of the Export Control Reform Act and conspiracy to commit international money laundering carry a maximum penalty of 20 years in prison. These defendants smuggled sensitive aircraft technology into Russia following its unprovoked invasion of Ukraine and did so in violation of laws designed to protect America's national security, Attorney General Merrick Garland said. Today's pleas reflect the seriousness with which the Justice Department approaches violations of the law that endanger the United States and benefit our adversaries. The Russian nationals will be sentenced on June the 17th uh, later this year. Uh, there was some inevitability about this, don't you think, mm. uh, that people might might try this, uh, uh, bearing in mind that the uh, there's very, you know, serviceable parts are very difficult to get into Russia at the moment. Mm. Mm. Yeah. It wouldn't surprise me if there are other people also doing this. We just haven't heard about it yet. Yeah. Because there's got to be a heck of a demand, hasn't there? There's still an awful lot of aviation going on in Russia. Mm. And they need to get parts, and they've got a lot of uh, a lot of Airbus and a lot of Boeing's. Yeah, it does make you wonder where they're getting the, the well, where they are getting the, spa the spares to keep their fleets going, because obviously they are still they've still got a functioning airline, uh, a state airline, haven't they? Aeroflot in in Russia that's still still you know flying to various destinations. Um, and these aircraft have to be kept going. I mean, whether they've just got a big reel of uh, mask and tape to cover off all the lights that are on the dashboard. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Al Alan's just saying, uh, sir, can you walk through the scanner again, please? There must be a mistake. An A320 <laughs> Fowler flap has just shown up on your trousers. <laughs> Ooh, uh, Mrs. Very good, Alan. Very good, Alan. <laughs> Love now, it. Matt, you've yes. got the next story, which is a very expensive story. Right, okay, yes, we'll take a look at this one then. Uh, it's, 
<laughs> but, uh, Nick has suggested in the notes here, hey, guess what? It's a Boeing Max Alaska story, but he didn't see that coming. Should we start playing bingo? Uh, <laughs> Indeed. Uh, the headline, Boeing pays Alaska Air $160 million after mid-air blowout. Uh, the uh, Boeing has paid $160 million, that's £126 million, uh, to Alaska Air to make up for losses the airline has suffered following a dramatic mid-air blowout in January. Alaska said that the money would address profits lost in the first three months of the year and it expected further payouts in the months ahead. However, However, a law firm which is representing some of the passengers on Alaska on the Alaska flight has criticised the move. Apparently, Boeing thinks it's more urgent and important to pay those whose corporate profits were at stake and not those lives who were at stake and nearly lost, said Daniel Lawrence, a partner at uh, Schrittermatter Firm at the Schritter Matter firm, sorry. Uh, airlines are now contending with delivery delays as Boeing slows production of the new planes to try to resolve the manufacturing and safety concerns. In February, Ryanair warned that holidaymakers faced paying higher fares because of the delays. United Airlines, which had a, also warned investors of, finan of a financial hit from the grounding, recently asked pilots to volunteer for unpaid leave due to the delivery ch changes. In January, Alaska are warned of a roughly $150 million hit, although we did experience some book, uh, some book away following the accident. What does that mean? Uh, we did experience some book away. No? Okay. Uh, following the accident and 737-9 uh, max groundings. February and March both finished above our original pre-grounding expectations, the airline said. Uh, Boeing did not comment but warned earlier this year that, the ex that it expected to spend at least $4 billion more than expected in the first three months of the year. Ow. The company had uh, been in crisis since the 5th January emergency in which passengers on the Alaska Airlines flight from Portland, Oregon and bound for California narrowly escaped serious injury. Uh, an initial report from the U.S. National Transportation Safety Board concluded that four bolts meant to attach the door securely to the aircraft had not been fitted. Uh, Boeing is now facing a criminal investigation into the incident itself, as well as legal action from passengers aboard the plane. Last month, Chief Executive Dave Calhoun uh, said that he would step down by the end of the year, the most high-profile leader to leave the company in the wake of the crisis. Hmm. Yeah, it's it's quite right what Nick puts in the uh, in the show notes here. You know, hmm. where is their big pot of money? I mean, that that they, they must have a hell of a pot of money because you know they've got this fine they're paying out. They're obviously paying out the passengers. You know the stuff for that, and obviously they're going to be paying out fines for this and the other. Their pot of money must must be huge at Boeing. But then, like I've read, I've read before online as well in the last week. You know, it's not just the commercial side that Boeing have; they also have their military side of the company as well, where, where they produce you know, military aircraft, which obviously, I think, Touchwood at the moment is doing reasonably well. Um, so perhaps they're—I don't know—perhaps they have got an endless pot of money. I wish I did. Indeed, indeed. Mm, yeah. Who knows? Right. Moving on to the next one, Nick, you've got this, and uh, God, this is only a few years back, I saw these guys uh, on a stand at an air show. Yeah, it's a bit of a shame about this one. So this is about um, the Icon Aircraft Company, uh, based over in the States. Um, some of the longer term listeners of the show might remember the interview that I did with Elliot Seguin, uh, the test pilot who uh, he actually did quite a bit of work for these guys in helping them to prepare the aircraft and do some um, do some updates to it. So, um, yeah, it's a bit of a pity that this has all um, gone a bit sideways for them. So Icon Aircraft, manufacturer of the Icon A5 amphibious sport plane, has filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Company officials say they're looking to sell the business uh, under Section 363 of the Bankruptcy Code while continuing to support its customers and operations during the Chapter 11 process. The purpose of the Chapter 11 filing is to resolve the company's financial challenges and position 
uh, and positioned the A5 for success for years to come, said CEO Jerry Meyer. We understand that this situation creates a hardship for everyone involved. However, without taking these steps, there is not a viable path forward for the business to do what we do best, build incredible airplanes and support our aircraft owners. The company expects to continue operations during the Chapter 11 process and seeks to complete an expedited sale process with the bankruptcy court approval, company officials added. Icon Aircraft has arranged for debtor in possession financing to fund operations during the bankruptcy proceedings, including honouring commitments to customers and vendors and fulfilling obligations to all employees, officials noted. So, yeah, it's... Um, I mean, it sounds like they are going to try and make a go of it, and uh, yeah, fingers crossed they will, because it's a it's a pretty unique aircraft actually. And um, yeah, I think you just put a picture up there, didn't you, Matt? It, I, I think did. they've gone to quite a lot of lengths to make the aircraft um, easier to fly and easier to train to use it, so that um, less experienced pilots can kind of jump into it and get up to speed a bit more quickly. Uh, they've made the, the avionics and the, the controls uh, a, a bit more simplified, I guess. Um, yeah, so it would be nice to, to see that they can try and keep this one going, hopefully. There was a story released um, earlier on today, well, actually first thing this morning, over in the US, and apparently, according to the story, it says here that um, ICOM are $173 million in debt. Wow. Goodness. That's a big number. Mm. Yeah. That's that um, a big number. That is a big number, yeah. Such a shame. Because the amphibious one looks awesome. There's, um, If you go on the Icon Aircraft website, there's a video of their amphibious version. It's, it looks, looks so good. It yeah. actually does look really yeah, good. Yeah, it's a really cool thing. Yeah. That's the only one they make. Hello, Armando. <laughs> <laughs> Where did he come from? <laughs> Look, yeah. I look. I, it is. Ter- that that green screen is very boring. It's by green the way, screen. just saying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Hello, team. Hello, Armando. I'm Are just you, with uh... you for a little bit. We've landed. The airplane is uh, buttoned up. We're here at Atlanta Hartsfield. Oh, as you do. Huh? Nice. Get you in amongst the big boys. Today, yes, indeed, yeah. it's a challenging weather day. So, um, it's always fun to. Knock out an approach right into Hartsfield. I bet. Excellent. I bet. <laughs> now, this, this one might interest you. Uh, next story, Armando, if you've not already seen this and clicked on the link, because it's quite it's a good bit of fun. Uh, it comes to us from aerotime.aero, and EasyJet have launched an online pilot aptitude test to find the next generation of recruits. So our low-cost carrier here in the UK, EasyJet, has launched a new online pilot aptitude test. And the test is part of a pan-European recruitment campaign designed to expel the myths about the type of people that can become pilots and encourage more applicants from unrepresented groups. The new test is being rolled out online targeting female audiences uh, who can log on to the EasyJet website, take part in a reaction speed and sense of direction assessment. The online test assesses some of the key skills required to become an airline pilot and has been designed to encourage more people to consider a flying career. EasyJet conducted a poll across the UK and discovered that 57% of people that a oh, 57% of people believe that a university degree is required to become a pilot, and 80% think that 2020 vision is a necessity. Neither of which is true. In fact, 50% of British people asked had no idea what qualifications were needed to become an airline pilot and learn to fly a commercial jet. The new campaign kicked off on April the 3rd this year in central London, where a real-life EasyJet captain, Captain Sarah Ackerley, was strapped to a huge billboard to answer questions about flying passenger planes for a living. More than half, or 59%, of British adults surveyed still believe there are misconceptions that a pilot's, is a pilot's job is for a man. Tackling gender stereotyping within aviation has been a long-standing mission for EasyJet, and they said they're excited to be part of this latest campaign, she said, allowing people to get a real insight into what skills are really important 
to do this job and encourage more women into the profession, Captain Ackley said. It's an immensely rewarding career. I'm proud to champion, and I hope by more people taking our new interactive test, they can challenge themselves to discover a talent they never knew they had and hope to see them flying with us in the future. The test and the billboard were launched ahead of the opening of EasyJet's 2024 pilot training program in the coming weeks. And the airline's pilot training program takes aspiring pilots with little to no flying experience to operating a commercial passenger jet in around two years with its intensive industry leading training course. To apply uh, to EasyJet's pilot training program, aspiring pilots need to be aged 18 or over. Excellent, done that one or uh, by the time they begin training, have a minimum of five general certificate of secondary education or GCSEs of grade C or above. Ah, oh, damn, that's me out there. Including mathematics, science, English, language, and uh, no other higher qualifications or degrees are required. To register interest for EasyJet's pilot training program or to simply find out more, you can visit the CAE and EasyJet's website for that as well so there we go so if you fancy having to go at that get yourselves over to uh, the website and um yeah see what uh, see what you think about that but it's a good idea i i um had a quick look this afternoon um and it is it is quite interesting to to kind of do what did you score uh, i'm not going to say oh <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Okay, that tells its own story. <laughs> well, I, well, I'm out of it anyway, straight away. I mean, the whole GCSE thing of um, f minimum of five GCSE grade C or above. Oh dear. Oh really? Oh, okay. me out. Mm -hmm. Nick, Nick's probably all right with that one. Yeah, I just about squeaked through. Um, <laughs> I see that BA have also uh, BA are also taking applications for their Speedbird Academy as well. So. It's nice to see that, uh, you know, a number of the airlines now are actually addressing the, well, I don't know whether we're still calling it a pilot shortage, but certainly mm. um, the airlines are uh, kind of actively recruiting internally, if you like, and um, implementing their own training schemes, which is fantastic. Yeah. What do you think, Nev? Good, good yeah. idea? Uh, very much so, uh, and it's needed. Uh, the only slight thing I would say is, uh, who do they talk to when it says that 59% of British adult surveys still believe there are misconceptions that a pilot is a job for a man? Mm. Well, I, you know, I was, uh, I, statistic yeah. that is. I, I, I must admit, I wonder where did they where did they find these dinosaurs? Just out of interest, I just like... well, but let, let's let's not be uh, too controversial. But I've I've got some. <laughs> ideas about that obviously. no fair enough yeah okay we'll, we'll keep it family friendly shall we <laughs> thoughts thoughts on Mando before we move on uh well not to turn this into military because oh, i'm only here go. for a uh, <laughs> oh here we go <laughs> did, oh. did nev just i think i felt a whiff of air from nev's, nev's breath here in atlanta uh no the military's been doing this for a long time these aptitude tests the military flight aptitude tests um the army's got one the air force uh, has the AFOQT plus a flight aptitude test. So um, we've been doing it for a long time where this is a uh, an avenue to weed out people uh, before they, you know, get all the way into mm. um, training. But also most airlines, most major airlines here in the U.S., they're not doing flight aptitude tests, but they are doing cognitive ability tests um, where you have to, that, you know, to do this sort of spatial uh orientation exam and then there's like a, a math portion to it and all that stuff so i know uh when i was doing my atp ctp at delta airlines they are that's part of their assessment process is uh, an online cognitive assessment so it's been doing this has been going on for a while mm. way to catch up <laughs> now nev you've got the next story and um i hope matt's got the um the picture from this story because it is a gorgeous aircraft in this picture it is, isn't it? It's on the aerotime.aero, and uh, it says that uh, Canadian charter airline Nolinor Aviation has announced a new pay scale for its pilots at the airline as it looks at ways to counter pilot shortages in the aviation industry. Uh, the company announced on April the 9th that the new pay scale features a salary increase from 25 to 40 percent, placing the starting salary of a new Boeing 737 captain at uh, $175,000 with progression to over 
$250,000 at the highest level. Uh, the initiative is complemented by an increase in rest days and a future review of the salary scale for first officers. Uh, at Nolinor, it says we are proud of the exceptional skills and dedication of our pilots. Their ability to operate in extreme conditions, be it on gravel runways or frozen lakes, demands recognition com uh, commensurate with their expertise. The salary review is an uh, investment in our most valuable asset, our employees, and reflects our determination to remain the preferred choice for aviation talent, Nolinor Avi uh, Aviation President Marco Prudhomme said. Uh, Nolinor added that a shortage of pilots in aviation has been compounded by regulatory t challenges and the after effects of the pandemic, but through an investment of its and its pilots, the airline is setting itself apart with a bold initiative aimed at valuing and retaining talent. Uh, the company is based uh, near Montreal and operates a fleet consisting of Boeing 737-200s, 737-300s, 747-400s and 737-800s. And you might have seen those pictures with the gravel kit fitted that uh, allows the 737-200 to land, land on gravel and unpaved runways, oh, which wow. is phenomenal to see it i must say but uh yeah interesting um but that's a pretty big salary increase isn't that that's not bad not bad is it a few quid yeah, yeah. yeah. Needed, I have to, I I, 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 a lot plenty of people comment in the chat room actually that uh yeah nolanor flies the um the dash 200 definitely one of those um more uh iconic looking 737 the versions of the 737 nev don't you think yeah I always like the, the ones that uh, BA and the others used to run uh, in the UK before they had the, the hush kits fitted to them. And these were noisy machines, uh, definitely. But, uh, yeah, those um, those engines, uh, is it the JT? JT-8Ds. Yeah. yeah, with the, the clamshell reversers. Yeah, quite, quite a classic-looking aircraft, that's for sure. Mm. Stunning bit of kit. I have a, I have a bit of uh, nostalgia for the, for this story actually because oh. this is prior to prior to you guys uh, taking me on the team. This was one of the things that I wrote in as a feedback item was the fact that Nolanor is still flying the two hundreds with the gravel kit. And um, for those people that don't know what that is, it's essentially a couple of big sticks that stick out the front of the the jets, and it basically blows. Um, well, it, high pressure air forwards to make sure that the engines don't ingest any gravel when you land on, a, on an unpaved runway. Um, and it also has some deflectors uh, fitted. Is it just the front wheel or is it all of the wheels? I can't remember. I think it's the front wheel, isn't it? On, but, yeah. but yeah, these guys that, I mean, the, the places they go into, they're going into kind of um, places where you sort of think twice about driving your car, really. Um, right. You know, right up in the north of Canada where it's kind of, um drilling for oil and all this kind of stuff and they're they're basically taking in uh crews to work on uh the oil projects up there as well as cargo um and the one of the unique things about their aircraft is the fact that they do a do the combi setup where they're they're actually oh, half they've got half. passengers and cargo um in the fuselage at the same time oh. so yeah it's, it's a really cool operation that those guys have up there it's a, yeah pretty unique yeah, awesome. There's some good pictures out or videos online of that, actually, the, the combi versions. It's very interesting. Now, moving on to the next uh, set of stories, this one, because it's been one of those weeks in the world of aviation. For those of you who might follow Aviation Herald, you probably have seen that there's been a few incidents this week of slight mishaps. Uh, Going to take a look at the first one here, which was uh, the well, it was the Southwest uh, incident in Denver, where the engine cowl separated from a Southwest aircraft. No doubt, you would have probably have seen uh, the videos online for this. I think it was on Twitter as well, uh, which you can see the video on there. Uh, in uh, it was actually quite a clear video. Someone had took on their phone of uh, the engine cowls just kind of flapping around on the sides of uh, of the 737 engines it, well, i think it was a dash 800 i think this was if i remember rightly yeah um but yeah um i think eventually they blew off uh, but luckily it didn't they didn't uh, cause any major damage and obviously the aircraft landed back okay but i think it's a case of the uh clips weren't 
pushed quite properly enough in, Nev. Somebody the engine did cowls. tell me that both on the 7.3 and A320 series, it is actually quite difficult to uh, make sure that to, to actually see that these clips are properly located. A few people have said that actually. Um, so yeah, um, it's it's the ground crew's responsibility, but ultimately it's the captain's responsibility or whoever's doing the walk around uh, to make sure that they are uh, well and truly fastened, isn't that? Mm. So, Nick, yeah. you've got the next one, which uh, we've got a video of this one, haven't we? Yeah, so this was um, an Edelweiss flight, uh, which was leaving Zurich. Um, yeah, we had a bit of discussion on our um, on our chat group, didn't we, about this one in the week. Um, I mean, you can see on the video for this, it basically sort of starts to take off. Um, and there, there we go, the, the video is rolling now. So it, it sort of commences its takeoff roll, gets up to speed as normal. Everything sort of looks like it's pretty normal. Gets to rotate, aircraft starts to go up aircraft starts to go up and then aircraft starts to go down again and it sort of pitches the nose down and sort of settles a bit looks like it's sort of fairly stable but it's just kind of floating along the runway and then finally manages to sort of gather up a bit of speed and, and on, it, on its way it goes again so uh, now i can't yeah, help we're... but feel that there was a bit of a brown trouser moment in the cockpit there because they, I mean, <laughs> they must have been <laughs> literally, much so. literally at a point where they're just thinking like you know at what point do we pull it do you know what i mean yeah. like at what point do we ab abort you know yeah i mean i guess it was you know fortunate that there was a decent amount of runway there but mm. uh, whether that would have that probably wouldn't have helped them in an abort situation well but, uh, uh, you, you you couldn't abort it because the aircraft was beyond v1 anyway yeah. and it was yeah. off the deck um now lots of conjecture about what the thing whether it was uh incorrect power setting incorrect flex setting for those engines um there was a tailwind involved possibly as well um and th there's so many things that that could have gone wrong there so it'd be interesting to see what the uh, the report uh comes up with but of course there's plenty of high ground around zurich airport as well and, and the uh, a340 300 series is not known for its particularly high performance engines compared mm. to the 600 either so uh armando what, what do you think what what's happened here do you think uh so nail on the head nev uh, as far as the abort the, <laughs> once you're airborne you're going one way or another and there's a lot of videos of uh, airplanes in South America, the mostly freighters <clears throat> that are, you know, I don't know how they do performance numbers down there, but uh, they will just keep it in ground effect and and then zoom off into the sky. But you, you're not wrong. I think there are probably a couple moments in there where they said, if nothing else, they're like, oh, man, we really messed this up. We're going to have to report, talk to our chief pilot about this. Um, the winds, I don't know that there was much of a wind because if you go towards the end of the video, you can see that there's a smoke uh, rising in the background from one of the hills and it's pretty straight up and down. So um, I'm going to lean towards uh, improper performance numbers put into the box. Yeah, John Jester says in the chat room, actually, I'm on the wrong weight or entered wrong weight. That was a very scary mm -hmm. event, he says. Oh well, yeah, yeah, and at that point, you're not going to put it back down on the ground. You're just going to you you really are just at, you're so far off the reservation at that point that hopefully you are relying on some airmanship skills that you have developed somewhere else to stay calm and just keep the airplane to flying. Lift. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Scary moment, especially mm. with the passengers as well. Mm. Don't forget the people sitting in the back as well. It's the bit where the nose dips that. You, yeah. you know will have been an Ooh. emotional event for the passengers shall we say yeah because you, you know you, anybody who's done any form of flying will think this don't feel right <laughs> yeah you will accelerate it's just what's in front of you yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. true <laughs> now matt you've got um the next one on here the next uh, event that happened and when when i saw the pictures of this online i could not get over the extent I know, I know. This is this is very much. A, oh, hang on. Sorry, I've just realised I got. So I got used to having John here, who's not here now, and it was. <laughs> so I got all the uh, the buttons like getting all all lackadaisical. Is uh, the headline goes on this one? Meanwhile, over in Austria, a poor innocent Airbus goes several rounds.
rounds with a jet bridge and comes off somewhat second best. Uh, yes. <laughs> the second best is this. That's quite the dint, isn't it? On the uh, so it's the the tail the tail end, I suppose, is it? Yes, it is the tail yeah. end of the of the, the jet here. The stabilizer, yeah, horizontal stabilizer, horizontal yeah. stabilizer, and. Um, yeah, it's going to take more than a bit of speed tape to fix that. Yeah, one. I think yeah, that was going to need to. That's going to, that one. <laughs> that one may be a challenge to buff out. Uh, yeah, that's quite a. Um, I'm fascinated to know. Oh, I suppose because it's it's ripped off the. There's a bit missing there, isn't there? That's what the problem is. <laughs> yes. Yeah. All right. Fair enough. Quite, yeah. quite a big bit, I would yeah, say. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah I'm there, curious there. to know what the sort of sheer. Um, the force, force must be quite required intense. in order yeah, to yeah, remove yeah. damage. Is you unreal. Know, that's, that's, a, yeah. that's also, a significant chunk of the aeroplane. Also, it, it, what happened here? The jetway yeah. was on the aft doors, and the airplane was moving forward, and then it ripped off the elevator. Like, yeah, what is going we, on here? Yeah. If, if we look further down as well, there's, they've they've also managed to back the wing into a lamppost as well, just to really kind of you just know, to be really sure. Into the wings. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. There's, really there's sure. also. If you find this story online, there's also a picture that's been taken. Um, you know where the the guys stand on the control panel at the air bridge to control the air bridge with the little the joystick. There's a picture that's been taken looking out from the air bridge mm. towards the aircraft, and that whole front of that air bridge where the control room is is an absolute mess mm, where it's been hit. So, but, I mean, do we know? Do we know what actually? You know, sort of happened. I mean, the rest of the thing it says in an instant that we'll be filing under the heading off. The tug driver would like to apply for more training, please. Uh, the Beluga aircraft was viciously assaulted in an extraordinary event. So <laughs> one of the uh, the horizontal stabilizers sheared off. How uh, the forces involved in this level of damage must have been really considerable. So, but do we know actually what happened? I mean, was it the plane that moved, or did the Air did like because you'd have thought the air bridge itself would somehow have some kind of like you know it would stop like if it met too much resistance or something like that that it would stop so surely the plane was moving in for some reason it has to have been mm. it has to I think I think it has to have been there, there, there has to be security footage of this I think most yeah. airports yeah, have that's a good point, security actually. cameras yeah. all you know on the ramp for sure yeah. I'm sure I read somewhere that this particular jet involved in this incident um was delivered three months ago oh. to the airline oh oh uh, Still captain got cruise. Planes, Mel. yeah captain cruise on the ch in the chat room says 10 months old oh, 10 wow. months old sorry 10 Oof. months old there we go so it man that's yeah scratch and desk scratch and dent discount mm. <laughs> on a new airplane. Do, you, do you think <laughs> yeah. it's got to be something like that hasn't oh, it yeah that also hello to jacob thomas who is sitting yeah. on the floor watching the show and uh, hello jacob col coloring i think nice yeah, doing some artwork well done jacob well done hopefully <laughs> it's pictures of aircraft that's good quite right quite right now nev you've got the last uh of uh, the uh well, mishaps here, a media mishap, I think this one is. Yeah, I mean, as you know, uh, it, you don't have to look very far for uh, poor reporting uh, in the go. mainstream <laughs> made, uh, media. But uh, how's this for a, a, a yet another example of the wrong aircraft being shown on a story? They've certainly pushed the boat out this time on the, the mirror uh, by showing a 747 uh, to uh, relate this story, which is an aircraft that hasn't, uh, the airline hasn't flown for more than four years. Now, this was the incident between the uh, Virgin uh, a sorry, a 787 and the BA A350. Um, but the attention grabbing headline uh, was pretty um epic i would say he throw horror as two passenger planes crash on airport runway not very accurate but also clickbait nonsense i yeah. i would say um and uh, I, I i think they've done a you know very poor job there uh, in their defense uh, they did at least later say uh, add a disclaimer <clears throat> to state that the aircraft uh, which being shown is no longer in service uh, with the airline. Uh, but um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know if we've got the video on, on Twitter uh, that that was shown there. But uh, no, it's this one. Yeah, unfortunately, I've just got a picture here. 
Yeah, but um, anyway, so uh, yeah, hardly uh, what the the Daily Mirror uh, did describe just as. Um, but uh, mm. there you go. Uh, we're, we're kind of used to it now, aren't we? That's the thing. It, it's it's almost unsurprising. In fact, it is unsurprising. Uh, but it, but it's super go. frustrating though, isn't it? Because the thing is, is like as you say, and this is this. I mean, we've had this argument before, haven't we, about clickbait? Uh, it's it's so wrong, isn't it? Because it's like you read that headline and think, oh my god, there's been a crash at Heathrow, and it's you know they were. Uh, I mean, were, I mean, were any passengers in any real danger danger during this particular incident? Probably not. I mean, it's just no, like, no, ugh, really. it just really winds me up. <sighs> I, w I will say, though, that one of our good friends of the show would have, judging by that picture, would have had a very, very good view of this. Mm, true. <laughs> you, know, you know who I'm talking about. Yes, yeah, in fact, yeah. I think uh, he did say he was on duty that day as well. Was he? Oh, um, God. I think he might have even been on ground frequency, so there, there may be a, a story to be told there uh, after the uh, accident report is yes, out. So, indeed. Uh, uh, we'll have to have a chat with him, perhaps. It, it, Reese, by the way, saying in the chat room there, whoa, I hope everyone is safe, uh, uh, is safe uh, after such a bad collision. Yeah. <laughs> now, they're moving on to the next story. Now, we're all, we've all flown on airliners many times, obviously Nev very frequently and we all know what you really shouldn't take in your hand luggage and what you should take and etc but nick what's this story all about yeah i i generally when i'm traveling by air i i normally try and check my blowtorch and my saw do you uh yeah i don't uh, they they get weird about it yeah i tend not to try and take those on board so uh, fair, fair yeah. I, I understand yeah. completely. Yes, maybe I'm just being a bit paranoid. Yeah, you know? old-fashioned. So, yeah. old, old, old fashioned. Old fashioned. Yeah. Yes, Fancy. So yeah, this is uh, um, a report from the BBC <laughs> saying um, Manchester Airport hand hand luggage plea as blowtorches and saws found. Uh, blowtorches, hacksaws, toy guns, and a lethal bottle of vodka. I mean, that's just silly. Uh, were among items confiscated from hand luggage at Manchester Airport in just one morning, bosses have revealed. Um, they must have had a good party afterwards, I should imagine. Um, Holidaymakers have been urged to follow the rules after about 400 banned items were seized. It comes after delays to plans for new scanners at airports. Uh, had a little story about that. Um, where the government had a 1st of July deadline um, that's now been extended, uh, as we talked about earlier. And Graham Matthews, the head of terminal security at Manchester, said that the new scanners were currently being installed. Um, he said that uh, they should be operational by the summer, um, but the rules on what will be permitted as hand luggage will remain the same. Um, <laughs> The haul of recent banned items included hundreds of lighters, packs of darts, hammers, packs a spud gun, darts. darts. And maybe they're just going to, you know, have a game of arrows while they're up in the air. Um, yeah, a spud gun. That's a good one. That's something I haven't heard since my childhood. Um, as travel picked up around the Easter holidays. Uh, the variety of items we seized in just a couple of hours shows what we deal with every day, Mr. Matthews said. Each time we have to pull a bag aside for a manual search, it takes several minutes and every search adds up and can slow down the whole security process. So out of all of us here on the team, who's been pulled up for something that they shouldn't have? Um, well, I, this is going quite a long way, a long time ago, at uh, Ben Gurion Airport, Tel Aviv leaving the country where you are interviewed extensively uh, by the security, even before you check in, by the way. So and that's obviously still the case today. Uh, I had to explain what a Denon professional mini disc player was. I had wow. to explain that for about 20 minutes before they would let me take it on the aircraft as hand luggage. Um, but uh, yes. Um, by the way, uh, there's no stereotyping whatsoever here. The fact is these are all found at Manchester Airport. I was just, just saying that. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> There's no north south divide on this nope. podcast. No, no, no. Perish, perish the thought. Perish no. the thought. Can I can I can I let go something deeply uh, embarrassing actually? Oh, yes, I, please. Yeah. Um oh, word. our re our recent trip to Ireland in fact, I have to confess. Um going through the airport security and 
I'm going to blame Armando because the last trip I did is I went to the States where I had uh, everything went in my uh, suitcase so I didn't have to think about it because I completely and I, this is genuine and as soon as I got pulled to one side I knew Im immediately what I'd done I'd forgotten about the 100 mil um, rule you know and yeah so I had to, the lady was I should I, I should say actually the lady was absolutely wonderful because I was so embarrassed when I realised what I'd done because um, I just put my wash bag in 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 my my hand luggage, didn't didn't bat an eyelid to it, and of course I got my full mint sauce, a brand new bottle of mint sauce, um, you know, shower gel and all that kind of oh. thing. That all, I know that all that all went straight in the bin, along with my can of deodorant. Everything else, fortunately, was compliant, so that that was fine. We just shoved them in a little plastic bag. But honestly, as I say, I felt so stupid because it was like. I know this. I'm on an aviation podcast. We talk about this quite frequently about the morons <laughs> holding up everybody else in the line, and um, <laughs> and it was just like, and here I am doing exactly the thing that you know. But as I said, and yet the thing is, is because I was so embarrassed, and I was saying to the lady, "I'm really, really sorry. I I know this. I'm so sorry." And I was, you know, she was like, that, you know, don't worry about it. And we, the, she took me to one side so that I could sort it all out while they were, while they carried on. So I wasn't like holding people up, which is really important. And the person next to me was busy losing their mind over the fact that last time they travelled through the airport, they were allowed to carry these extra bits and pieces that were more than a hundred mil. Yeah, um, Nineteen eighty-two, and they, did, and they yeah. don't, and they didn't understand <laughs> why they were being challenged on it when they only did a flight a few weeks ago and it wasn't a problem. Um, you know, in stark contrast to me, who was genuinely a blithering idiot and suddenly realised what he'd done. Um, Dirt, Dirt Guess is commenting, Matt, on no, you. No, I don't want to look at it. I don't want to look. Do <laughs> I don't want to look. <laughs> dozens of fellow passengers passing Matt, shaking their I know, oh, 100%. Oh, no, I could, <laughs> I could feel the daggers as they walk past me. There's no two ways about now, it. Now, our, just... our se well-seasoned resident pilot and passenger in the uh, group here, Armando, come on, admit it. What have you done? What have you forgotten in the part in the past when you've been traveling through security? Oh, for sure. I actually just recently, because I got so used to uh, taking food with me when I was crew and I had KCM that I have on numerous occasions I've forgotten that I had a water bottle in my bag. And oh. it, uh, it, I, I feel like, I, I feel like you, you guys in some British terminology would have a really, really nice word for this. Like I felt like a right something. I don't know. Nob, yes, I was going to say, but yeah. <laughs> Plonker. It always sounds nice when you guys say yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, no, I've forgotten uh, water bottles a couple of times. I think one time I even uh, I had a pocket knife in there because because <gasps> a lot of times I travel and I have a, a small toolkit with me to... Ah, um, yeah, of course, yeah. You know, because uh, when I fly, I have screwdrivers and things like that, high glass uh, repair things. Uh, Richard Adams would like to put forward pillock, by the way, as as the chosen word for uh, for what to be referred to as. I don't even know what that means, but it sounds so nice. I'll take it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Oh dear. Yes, indeed. Uh, yes. Anyway. Oh, right, he, that, that... he's still Dirk's still going on about it. By the way, as you say, we've got the dozens of fellow uh, passengers uh, passing Matt, shaking their heads, and then people covering their children's <laughs> eyes is the other one. It's just, uh, <laughs> I mean, it's harsh but fair. Uh, <laughs> oh, Dirk, what oh, are you my... like? Oh, very yeah. good, very good. Yeah, weirdly, they're more they're more bothered about the water bottle. Yeah, you're probably right. To be fair, um, Reese, it's that that is a funny one, isn't it? It's, uh, and I, I think we've all done that accidentally, haven't we? Because I guess you sort of like foolishly assume that i, I suppose because once you've bought it airside it's okay isn't it you can yeah, carry on with yeah. the with the water bottle i guess because everything that comes airside has all been scanned and stuff like that but yeah. the, thing, the thing with nev he holds it you see because he because he knows he's heading straight into that beautiful da lounge oh, yes of course he, yes. yeah he doesn't have to worry yes well no it's just, they, they bring the water to him uh, <laughs> in in that lounge he doesn't have to go and collect it himself i mean goodness me <laughs> so, yeah, so on the, I'll ask my flunky to do it for me quite right <laughs> absolutely indeed absolutely yes uh, uh, it's, it's it's like pillock only nicer armando just uh, <laughs> anyway <take> <laughs> nev sticking sticking with you nev and sticking with glamour you've got the next one 
Yeah, I like this story. I was reading it uh, earlier on, actually, today. It's on the uh, Guardian.com, and it says that uh, six decades on from the arrival of the jet age, aviation is looking back to the future as niche business demands and infrastructure gaps pave the way for a revival of seaplane production. Uh, in Australia, Qantas's first passenger services to the UK, operated in conjunction with Imperial Airways, departed Rose Bay Airport and arrived at Southampton. 10 days and 35 refuelling stops later Oof. much faster than the 40 days the journey took by ship at the time uh, the frequent hopping along the route uh, made for the nickname the kangaroo route which continued to be used for the Australia to London flights bearing in mind at the moment we're doing you know London to Perth non-stop and I think it's next year or the year after well it's 2025 actually they're talking about doing uh, the concert going to be doing the London to Sydney and London to Melbourne routes directly uh, but of course Qantas operated flying boats on this route which was a distinct category of larger seaplane where the fuselage serves as a ship hull when in the water as opposed to the often smaller float planes that have floats mounted underneath the fuselage keeping it above the water <coughs> as it lands excuse me the Qantas Empire aircraft, as the joint venture was known, was first class only, carrying up to 14 passengers who could enjoy a promenade cabin, galley, a wine cellar and socialising areas. Now, the Second World War marked a turning point in commercial aviation, largely bringing to a halt the glamorous age for flying boat based travel. The war brought amongst a, a war brought about the mass proliferation of runways built around the world for military aircraft. By the end of the war, there were runways in most destinations and propeller and jet engine technology had advanced. Seaplanes, which were slower and less direct and more susceptible to bad weather and less economical, struggled to stay competitive. People thought seaplanes weren't needed anymore, and they were probably true back then, says Dan Webster, who's the chief executive officer of Amphibian Aerospace Industries, AAI. The Darwin-based company is amongst a handful of manufacturers seeking to revive production of seaplanes for a new age in aviation. Well, AAI is reviving the Albatross G Triple One T or G One 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 T, a flying boat. boat first flown in the late 1940s by the US Air Force and Navy. More than 400 were built by the American manufacturer Grumman, uh, but the planes have been out of production now for 60 years. Originally a radial engine aircraft, the new generation will feature turboprop engines. Some owners of Albatrosses have uh, retrofitted turboprop engines, but on an individual basis only. No company can do it en masse, as AAI now owns the certificate to produce the aircraft. The 19-metre-long fuselage will sit up to 28 passengers as well as crew, or can be fitted out to carry cargo or as a medical aircraft uh, when the first of the New Age Albatrosses rolls off the production line in about four years. Uh, aviation finds itself in the grip of a dynamic and disruptive phase, according to Professor Tim Riley, who's head of aviation at Griffith University. Commercial airlines are pinning their hopes on sustainable aviation fuel as well as more efficient aircraft from manufacturers as ways to meet looming emissions reductions targets as well as to save on their fuel bills. Interest in seaplanes waned throughout the 20th century, but they never disappeared entirely, especially in harbour cities. Uh, Riley notes that uh, Vancouver Har Harbour Air operates scheduled services around the city and Victoria Harbour uh, uses similar float planes. They do high demand short trips and it's commercially viable, he says, adding that for tourist orientated seaplane services, customers can expect to pay more because the aircraft are not put to use constantly to maximise returns as they are in scheduled services. In Sydney, seaplanes still operate out of Rose Bay, where they fly mostly on tourist runs to places such as Palm Beach. This convenience factor is a major part of the revival in interest and race to bring new seaplanes to the market, Webster says. Uh, operators of resorts on t remote islands who struggle to convince the weekend travellers to forfeit almost a day in travelling on multiple planes and boats to reach them are one such niche market 
crying out for amphibious aircraft, he says. Uh, for the people who run island resorts, our aircraft can fly from an international airport and land on water right at the resort, so it opens up the short, day, uh, short stay market that wouldn't be possible. As the world has grown and islands have developed around the Pacific and north of Darwin, the equation for seaplanes has changed again. Uh, he says that planes could also be used to provide medical care for hard to reach areas north of Darwin, including several indigenous communities. It opens up a whole new range of possibilities for treatment centres for casualty evacuation. We can land on water and come up a boat ramp to park, he says. Imagine doing a milk run around the Whitsundays or to islands in Indonesia where most are serviced by very slow ferries or helicopters. This is a game changer. Uh, there are also people in New York looking at this sort of thing, wanting to fly these off the Hudson River because it's so tough to get to an airport. Well, I think that's a very interesting thing, especially the medical mm. side of things. That's, mm. that's always a problem, isn't it? Trying to evacuate people from hard to get to communities. But mm. uh, no, interesting. So they're talking about four years time. That will be worth waiting out for, I would say. I agree. Yeah, I haven't have to say haven't haven't been lucky enough to have, have flown on a, a De Havilland Twin Otter uh, sea plane a few years back. No, um, it's such an incredible experience to, to to you know be a passenger on a sea plane, especially something like the the Twin Otter. Mm. But um, yeah, it's incredible, incredible bits of kit these sea planes. But it, it does, like you said, Neb, it does look quite stunning, doesn't that picture that there on that story, the Albatross two point zero amphibian. Especially in that blue. Mm. I'm ready. I'm ready to go training. You guys know where to reach me. <laughs> I'm ready. Quite right. Absolutely. You tell the them. The feeling is yeah. there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Indeed. Have you, now, have you ever flown anything like that, Armando? I've flown in an old school Albatross, the radial engine ones. And then we have a Grumman uh, Widgeon, I think it is. It's a smaller version of the Albatross at one of my local airports. Um. Mm. Yeah, but this is uh, the utility is there for this. The, the market, the niche is there for it. So mm, indeed, I wish them luck, but I I don't think they need it. No, indeed. Now, sadly, we've got to say goodbye to you, Armando. Have we not? Yes, sir. Uh, I have to go grab some food and then come back here and get ready for our departure. Um, so you guys have a great rest of the show, Nev. I'll be listening. You can't get you can't get rid of it. Can't get rid of the gray. Not yet. Absolutely, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, have you guys already struck the military? There's a no, 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 no. It's still no, there. No, 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 there's no, no, a death no, look in Carlos's no, face. No, no, it's all still there. Mm. It's, it's all still, still there. Don't panic. No, no. Have, a, have a safe flight. Yeah. All thank, right. Thanks, thanks, guys. thanks for dropping in, Armando. Take care. Have a great show. Bye. Bye. Now moving on to the next story, which concerns an aircraft that first flew back in 1958. Blimey. Uh, this is from aerotime.aero and uh, NASA's DCA. If you're a fan of the DCA, get the tissues ready because you're going to be crying. NASA's DCA bows out after 37 years of groundbreaking scientific research. So, NASA's very own DCA, Douglas DCA aircraft, has completed its last mission for the US Space Agency after carrying out 37 years of groundbreaking scientific research. The four-engine powerhouse, famous for being the largest flying science laboratory in the world, joined NASA back in 1987 as the core aircraft for the agency's airborne sp uh, science missions. However, on April the 1st this year, the intrepid narrow-body aircraft registered November 817 November Alpha completed its final mission and returned to the agency's Armstrong Flight Research Center Building 703 in Palmdale, California. A water salute by the U.S. Air Force's Plant 42 Fire Department greeted the DC-8 and crew home after the aircraft spent 2024 collecting detailed atmospheric data over several locations across Asia. As well as supporting scientists, researchers and students from NASA throughout its career, the DCA also played an important part in research for federal, state, academic and foreign institutions. NASA's DC-8 was built back in 1969 and stretches 157 feet long with a 148-foot wingspan. The aircraft has a range of 5,400 nautical miles, can 
fly at altitudes from 1,000 to 42,000 feet for up to 12 hours. The jet has been highly modified uh, to support the agency's airborne science missions and incorporates a suite of sensors, data systems that can be tailored to specific missions or instruments. The aircraft will officially retire in May uh, this year after concluding operations and then move to its new home at Idaho State University in, I hope I pronounce this correctly, Pocatello, Idaho, where it will be used to train future aircraft technicians by providing the real-world experience in the college's aircraft maintenance technology program. Now, that's good news. I'm glad to see they're not just going to fly this out to the desert cover it in tin foil and hide it away forever and ever at least they're going to um use this for you know for a good purpose afterwards but do you not know, nev of all the aircraft that i've flown on in my many years of going you know around europe and the world on aircraft i never got the chance to fly on a dc-8 no me neither no uh and uh, yeah what a what a classic aircraft uh, it is mm. or it was uh, too but uh, no me neither i i never had the chance to go on the dc and did you know that they they uh when they re-engined these they re-engined these with the cm56 cfm56 oh okay the power of the um, right. yeah power of the air the 320s oh, yeah. interesting yeah. Yeah, or was it no? Sorry, the seven three. Sorry, powered the seven threes. Yeah, had yeah. Uh, they retrofitted those on to the aircraft because it was originally powered by the JT three D, which was the predecessor to the JT eight D. So yeah, bit of history there for you. Very good. Right, so we have got uh, another interview coming up in a, just a moment from Dublin. It's another exciting instalment from there, but uh, it's time for one of our newest parts of the show. Uh, which we have each week, is to bring back a retro airline advert of the week. Now, Nev, what's what's this week's retro aviation advert? Uh, well, I don't know, because it doesn't say in the show notes what it is. It just says, uh, this week is a classic from 1980, uh, but an airline that Captain Jeff may know very well. When you're ready, really ready, We'll be there when you are. Delta is ready to fly. Yes, we're ready to fly. High in the sky, where the sun shines all day, every day, the Delta jets go flying from Atlanta to Europe, Canada, the Bahamas, Bermuda, the Caribbean, into more than 80 cities in the USA. Other Delta jets are winging home to Atlanta's new terminal, the biggest in the world. Delta is the largest airline at the world's largest terminal, with more ticket counter positions, more boarding gates, more baggage claim units than any other airline, and more flights than any other airline in any other city in the world. Delta is ready. We're ready when you are. Delta is ready. We're ready when you are. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> My goodness. Oh, uh, so good. <laughs> It's quite the blast from the past, isn't it? <laughs> that was that. Would, I mean, that's as that's as retro as you can get, I think, isn't it? You know, yeah, yeah, I think adverts, so. But yeah, uh, yeah. definitely. And uh, you said, Matt, you you think that sounded just like Captain Jet? I thought that, yeah, yeah. I thought that. I thought you know, if you if you know, it's, it sounded like a young Captain Jeff being all silky and you know. Sort of yeah. <laughs> well, perhaps he was doing some freelance uh, voiceover be. work before they paid him the big bucks. You know, true, so. true, absolutely. Perhaps yeah. that's how he got in. Perhaps, perhaps the story he's told us all many a times was actually all a sham. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> anyway, Nev. What is coming up next? Well, we're going back to Dublin for another interview uh, with uh, the folks who are at the, the Drone Summit. And this one is an interview with Annalisa Russell. Uh, sorry, Annalisa Russell-Smith of Flyby Technology. Well, Annalisa has been flying drones since 2019, but in 2020, she decided to complete her professional drone pilot trailing and was very swiftly swept up into the this most exciting of industries. She was seeking an opportunity to bring drone flying to her videography and storytelling business, but one thing led to another and now she leads arguably one of the most exciting projects in the industry. Drones have a, an enormous contribution to make in delivering materials such as seeds and saplings to places that quad bikes and people find inaccessible. In disaster relief operations, drones can fly food, water 
and medical supplies to places rendered impossible to get to with land vehicles. They can also fly people out, of course, and disaster areas cannot wait five days for drone pilots and operators to come together. They must start flying within 48 hours. And that response is her job, helping reduce risk to life in challenging times and helping grow the drone industry to create rewarding jobs. Well, Carlos spoke to Annalisa about her work. So I'm here with Annalisa Russell-Smith from Flyby. Great to see you here. You too. Um, yeah, thank you for having it's me. It's good, good to have you on the show. So tell us a bit about uh, what you do. Okay, so uh, I wear a lot of hats because I work for um, a small company. Like you said, it's Flyby Technology. So uh, as CSO, I'm responsible really for making sure that we uh, are able to produce the best possible product for, um, for our clients but also to determine the direction of travel for the, for the company because the drone industry as you know is a fast changing environment. We um, have designed a capability for uh, military use but it's a dual use platform so um, there are lots of possibilities for it. So looking at how you developed not just the aircraft, but all the relationships that you build to go along with it, that's all sort of part of the role that I uh, fulfill, and lots more besides. So a bit about the company Flyby then. What is their kind of mission statement as such? Well, um, we've actually been looking at what our mission statement is because, you know, as you uh, evolve as a business, you know, you're, it's not that, you're, that your vision changes, but the statement of what you actually uh, are actually doing uh, might change. So um, the, the company was founded by John Parker, uh, who was a former Sea Harrier pilot, Buccaneer pilot, uh, Tornado pilot, lots of experience uh, as a weapons instructor, but he also was the um, uh, aviation integration manager for F-35 into the two new aircraft carriers. So our vision for the drone industry is based on the spirit of excellence because with the sort of military background that John has but also all our instructors, because we were initially a training company, um, we still do a lot of training commercial, uh, uh, commercial pilots for um, for their drone uh, commissions. A bit about yourself because I know you've got a a connection to the Smithsonian oh, over gosh. in the US. One of those places that I would love, I still need to visit, I need, need to get out there. You definitely now, have to. Now, you've been there, but you've got a special uh, connection with the Smithsonian, haven't you? Uh, well, it was quite an honor to be um, uh, inducted into the uh, Women in Emerging, Emerging Aviation Technology Hall of Fame, that's quite a mouthful, um, with women and drones. Um, at, at the Smithsonian. The ceremony was there. It was an amazing event. Uh, and, you know, just to just be able to take all of that in, um, flying to Washington um, and uh, just meeting some amazing um, people along the way, uh, who were just very excited just to see what everybody was doing. You know, I, I just think that a place like the Smithsonian and the aviation community, generally speaking, we were talking about this earlier. Um, it's it's such a, an incredibly um, supportive environment. It doesn't matter what the background is of the person um, and how much flying experience you have. It's the very fact that you're interested that makes that connection happen. And um, yeah, I was thrilled to go there. And what a what a venue to you know, to go and receive an award. Did you have to give a speech on stage? Actually, no, some, they, were, they were talking about us and we were standing there in our, you know, evening gowns or, or whatever uh, with this wonderful award. But, uh, but yeah, the, the, the sort of recognition for the fact that, A, working in emerging tech is always a bit challenging. You're out there, you know, and uh, not everybody necessarily understands what you're doing. Um, so, so it's pretty special, I have to say. Yeah. So, sort of rounding off, really, kind of your um, flying, because you have done some flying. You've flown, is it the the micro light or the light? Uh... Yeah, I. Uh, oh my gosh, I. 
I've been flying since I was quite young, in my late teens, and you know, I could I'd save up for a lesson, and then you, you don't get very far towards your PPL when you're when you're doing that. But I just wanted to be in the air. You know, the RAF wouldn't have me because I was a girl. I was it was a, a, a couple of years later when when they were taking uh, uh, women um, to train as pilots, uh, fast jet or otherwise. Um, but uh, but yeah, I, I just wanted to fly whatever I could get my hands on, and so. Um, I started um, learning to hang glide. I, I went to live in, in Canada and you get inspired by people, don't you? So I've, I've done a lot of crazy things like um, traveling around the world by myself um, before you know cell phones were actually even invented. And so I'd been and I'd attempted to climb Kilimanjaro. I didn't get quite to the top. Um, I got to, um, uh, I, I didn't get to summit. I got altitude sickness, which is sort of ironic, really. But um, but I went to an, an air show, and there was a, a father and son who were um, hang glider instructors who made this amazing movie about climbing Kilimanjaro and flying down. And and I just looked at that and I thought, I want to do that. So I did, and it was a school that was um, next, pretty much next door to uh, Pearson International in Toronto. And um, yeah, it wasn't long before I decided, no, I, I really need an engine. So I then found an instructor um, to teach me how to fly ultralight trikes. And it was in the course of that, um, um, I, I had a few lessons with him. And then I met these fantastic people who had a share in a small grass strip in upstate New York. And so they invited me to go there. And I started flying with an instructor. And I have, oh my gosh, it's about 200 hours as a student pilot, which is rather a lot. Um, but it was because I had access to, um, a, it, was a, it was a Cessna 152. Um, and I just had to put gas in it and fly. And I used to love practicing takeoffs and landings and this pretty much going out and getting lost because in the US they have these amazing water towers with the names written on them. So even as you're learning to navigate, once you you know can fly, you're signed off to fly solo, of course, um, you can go on some little adventures. And uh, I had such fun. Um, but um, I still haven't finished, which sounds crazy. I need to finish off my PPL. But, um, but again, just having the exposure, I, I wish that more people had the chance to even just try flying because you learn so many things about yourself, but you also meet so many amazing people. You know, it doesn't matter uh, whether you're flying a, you know, a, a Piper Cub, which I would love to have a Piper Cub, or um, or an ultralight, or, or or anything else. You know, the the experimental designation I think in the U.S. is is um, I think I think it brings a lot more people into aviation, uh, or makes it a bit more affordable perhaps as well. But suffice to say, um, I've made so many friends through the aviation community from when I was quite young. But it's been all kinds of different things. You know, airplanes to um, my fighter pilot friends uh, to drones and it's it's just a you know it's a journey that you can't explain to someone unless they're sort of involved but you know when you're passionate about something it takes you places doesn't it like your podcast you know it's just <laughs> yeah. yeah one last question for yes. you uh, as you are a pilot as you know as well we're going to ask you a question we ask all the pilots we have on the show uh, you can go to Dublin Airport now, yes. and jump into any aircraft, yes. GA, military, commercial, yep. retired, still flying, yep. and go out there and have a flight. Okay. We're on your own, just take it away. What's it going to be? It's got to be a Spitfire. I had a feeling you might say that. Really? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, I, uh, I grew up actually, um, well, my primary school was next door to the old Supermarine headquarters at Hursley Park in Hampshire and when I was at school some of the dinner ladies had actually they'd worked there and I used to ask questions about you know what, what was it like and you know and then 
there was a fantastic BBC podcast called Spitfire, The People's Plane. Oh, yes. And what I loved about that was that it, you know, recreate, well, not recreated, but the um, they had actors uh, actually voice diaries from people at the time. And, I mean, I knew lots about the Spitfire. The, I was so sad when they took down the Spitfire Bridge. It was an iron bridge that, you know, um, existed before they finished off the motorway and took it down, that a Spitfire had flown underneath. Um, and it's just so amazing. The ingenuity of people raising money to get more Spitfires yeah. built was one thing. But the fact that um, I feel like we're on a similar journey to get the Jackal into service as um, RJ Mitchell went through, and that sounds crazy really, but we're so good at innovation. And um, Spitfire and the sound of those Merlins. engines, yeah, the Merlins, when you th when, it's unmistakable, but the story of it is, is, uh, is just amazing. And that, that was a particularly wonderful podcast, I have to, have to say, putting that story together just so you can see what, what we are capable of. On that note, where can people find out more about uh, the, you know, the, what the work you do? Um, they can, well, flybytechnology.com is, uh, is our website where you'll find more about the Jackal. Um, for training, um, easy, to fly, easy to find rather, um, and uh, flyby drone training, drone training rather, .co.uk. Um, or just Google flyby uh, drone training if, if people are interested in some fantastic um, experience learning how to fly drones, you know, whether it's commercially or for fun. Excellent. I might try that one day. You yeah, never know. You should. Yeah, it'll pro it'll probably end up in the garden in pieces, but there no, we go. no, no, no. <laughs> you know, it's about building confidence. I know. I yeah, know, I we'll know. do that for you. Annalise, it's been absolutely amazing to talk to you. Too. Thank you for taking time out of the day to speak to us welcome. today at the Drone Summit yes. here in Dublin. And I wish you all the best for the future. Thank you very much, Carl. Thank yeah, you. We'll see you again. Thank you. Take care. Cheers. Yeah, you know, we've got some great content on, on our uh, trip to Dublin, Nev, and we've still got tons more. Oh, plenty more to, to come. come no sort of that. So thank yeah. you very much indeed to Annalisa yeah. for uh, speaking with you and with us. And uh, I'm going to post that uh, interview on our LinkedIn page and our Facebook page after the show tonight. So uh, thanks again, Annalisa. Really appreciate your time. Yes. So it is time for Nev's favourite part of the show. It's, of course, time for the military segment. So, Matt, if you're ready. Uh, no, it won't work. Hang on. Trying again. <laughs> uh, here we go. Watch up, buggies, one, three, five, fifty, angel, sixteen, heading three, four, zero. Okay. Hunters, eight, buggies. First in this week's thrilling instalment of the military news uh, is from EDP24. It's local to me and Matt here in Suffolk in the UK. Uh, this is the old Buckingham Air Show. We uh, to, to debut. I mean, this is this is going to sell out this year quick. Uh, the, to debut the F-35 aircraft at the event. So the Lockheed Martin F-35, the UK's most formidable aircraft, will make its first non-military air show appearance at Old Buckingham on July the 24th this year. Based at RAF Mara, the F-35 is the cutting edge of aviation and military technology. Operated by the Royal Air Force and the Royal Navy, the machine is capable of operating from the UK's newest fleet of aircraft carriers thanks to its stovel or short takeoff and vertical landing ability. Uh, it hovers just like a helicopter and is at an airborne between 0 to 1,227 miles per hour. The F-35 will be uh, at very few military air shows this year, and Old Buckingham will make history as the first civilian air show to showcase the aircraft. Ooh. Also debuting this year will be a newly restored P-51 Mustang called Jersey Jerk. The Imperial War Museum's Spitfire Mark 1A will also be there and the only P-47 Thunderbolt flying outside of the USA will also 
be there this year, Nelly. Wowing attendees with their displays will be crowd favourites like the Turbulent Team and the only electric aircraft formation team in the world, the Nebo Air Electric Arrows. Matt Wal uh, Wilkins, organiser of the Old Buckle Air Show. Oh, hello. What's going on? <laughs> okay, we're, we're, we're starting the segment again. <laughs> Ticket sales for the air show. Carry on. I think we should do a whole show just <laughs> for playing intros. Ticket sales are already on their way above last year's record sellout time for this time of the year. The F-35 will only make the inevitable sellout even earlier this year for Old Buckingham. Uh, he also said we're immensely grateful to all the uh, at the RAF and RF Marham's brilliant team and tickets that can be purchased at Old Buckingham Air Show. Dot com. If you've not been, trust me, it is a sellout air show here. We are lucky to have it on our doorstep here. They have a phenomenal amount of aircraft uh, on display over the two days that they have the air show. Um, but, yeah, if you've not been already and you are in minor Matt's neck of the woods, uh, just check out the old Buckingham Air Show. Mm. Well worth a visit. So, talking about autonomous drones, Matt, next one. Oh, right, yes, it is uh, on the... Uh, Aerotime. Aerotime.aero uh, page. Sorry, it's... Uh, sorry, I was trying to work out why it automatically triggered when it shouldn't have done. Uh, Aerotime.aero <laughs> is the article. Uh, and the headline is USAF... Um, and it's still... <laughs> Everything's going wrong. Uh, the first uh, US UA, bleh, USAF to begin F-16 fighter autonomous testing. The first three US Air Force F-16 fighting Falcons arrived at Eglin Air Force Base in Florida to be modified into test platforms to evaluate autom autonomous capabilities. This testing is part of the Viper Experimentation and Next Gen Operations Model Autonomy Flying Testbed, the Venom AFT program designed to accelerate the testing of autonomy software for crewed and uncrewed aircraft. The Venom program marks a pivotal chapter in the advancement of aerial combat capability, says Major Ross Elder, Venom developmental test lead. This transformative program holds the potential to redefine air combat par paradigms. Ooh. It's a nice word, isn't it? By fostering novel autonomous air uh, functions for current and future crewed and uncrewed platforms. The uh, six F-16 fighters will eventually join the test campaign, which will be conducted by the 40th Flight Test Squadron and the 85th Test and Evaluation Squadron. The pilots will oversee the autonomy in the cockpit, confirm that the flight and mission systems test objectives are achieved, achieved and provide provide feedback to autonomy developers. The knowledge gained from the Venom program will support other US military auto autonomy related initiatives including the Collaborative Combat Aircraft, the CCA program, which aims to give combat drones fighter-like capabilities. It is part of the Next Generation Air Dominance, the NGAD program of the USAF, which plans to replace both F6, X, F-15 Eagle and the F-22 Raptor with a system of systems built around a sixth generation fighter jet. Easy for me to say, it would seem. Um, yeah, now this is a... Uh, I feel like this is something that should have, you know... I, I, you know, the technology's moved on so much now, isn't it? We always, we almost don't need people in the cockpits, do we? I suppose, it, you know, it's essentially, it's, it's all just become a massive computer game, isn't it? Yeah, there's some interesting notes at the bottom of that story of Matt. I don't know if you can see uh, that. Yes, there. indeed. Uh, it says uh, the first F-16 took to the skies on the 2nd of February 1974, 50 years ago this year. Over 4,600 have been built so far. The F-16 has also been procured by the air forces of 25 other nations. As of 2023, it is the world's most common fixed-wing aircraft in military service with 2,100 and forty-five F-16 currently operational. That's it's done well. Nut, that's a nuts number. It's done well for an aircraft that's fifty years yeah. old this year. It's done phenomenally well. Indeed, yeah. utterly nuts. 
Yeah, it'll be a shame that they uh, the Belgium F sixteen display team. I don't think they're they're not going to be at um, React this year. They um, they've cancelled this year, which is a shame because it was good to see those guys. Uh, Nev, or no, actually no, uh, Nick, you've got the next one. He went uh, a funny colour there for a minute. He went a funny colour there. <laughs> <laughs> Nick. You got a Nick. narrow reprieve there, Mr. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Nick, Nick's got yeah. the next story. So, yeah, this one is from zonamilitar.com, and it's the first of the F5 Tiger fighters brought from Switzerland by Marine Corps to serve as aggressors in the USA. As part of the program to purchase 22 F-5 Tiger fighters from Switzerland by the United States Marine Corps, uh, the first aircraft arrived in the USA um, just at the end of March. More precisely, they arrived at the facilities of Cecil Field Tactical Air Support Plant located in Jacksonville, Florida, to undergo a second phase of the Artemis program and subsequently joined the force's aggressor fleet to strengthen the dissimilar training capabilities of new pilots. In 2020, the United States Marine Corps and the Swiss Federal Office for Defense Procurement formalized an agreement for the sale of 22 F-5 Tiger fighters uh, with 16 single-seat F-5Es and six two-seat F-5Fs. Uh, these aircraft from the Swiss Air Force had been retired from service and preserved for potential sale to foreign users. With their incorporation, the Marine Corps sought to strengthen and increase the availability of its current aggressor fleet, grouped in the 401st Fighter Squadron, known as Sniper, based at Marine Corps Air Station Yuma, as well as the formation of a second squadron, of this type of aircraft. The agreements also included the refurbishment of the aircraft by the company RUAG. Among the works carried out on the Tigers, services such as uh, maintenance, repair and overhaul were highlighted for the 22 selected airframes along with their respective 44 J85 engines. So I don't know if they're going to be presumably using these as... Um, Pretend baddies, for want of a better way of putting it. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I, I had to. I had to just quickly Google the F five just to just to refresh my memory on what this looked like. And one of the searches that came up was to purchase. You can actually buy one of these. You can actually buy yourself an F an Orthrop F five. And they they currently second hand prices. They they currently start at nine hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Ouch. That's a that's not bad. Should we club together? <laughs> hmm. <laughs> it's not bad for a for you know for an aging uh, military. What do you reckon the running costs would be on one of those? Oh my word! Yeah, <laughs> I definitely <laughs> wouldn't want to put fuel in this. That's for sure. No. Yeah, that's no. true. <laughs> Indeed. Right, time for this week's caption. This just for fun pick of the week. Now, uh, pop the picture up on uh, our social medias earlier on in this week, and it's this. This week was a kind of this is an interesting picture. Nev, I, I kind of when I found this picture, I thought this would be kind of your level of luxury. Oh, <laughs> yes. Absolutely. Well, I can't see the picture at the moment, so... Um, oh, oh, here it is. That's, there we go. <clears throat> yes, my idea of, of heaven. That's a 747-400, is it? Or is that something else? It, difficult to Ooh. see. Anyway, uh, the crew rest area has got a very comfortable-looking bed uh, in it, although I would have preferred two pillows myself. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> Uh, but uh, yes, so um, so starting off uh, with lots of comments here. Um, C Bob Cronman says, uh, result of AI autopilot demanding union representation over rest period on long haul. Okay, uh, some quite controversial comments on this week. Mark Collins uh, comes up with Ryanair. Ryanair rents unique spaces for only fans oh. <laughs> rental is only 10 pounds per 30 minutes or 500 pounds once you've actually managed to check out 
on their website. Oh, my. Right. <laughs> OK. Uh, Richard Leach is saying aviation authorities have finally agreed three crew flight decks are safer. The first engineer returns. No, the flight engineer would be very happy to return. To I, that I bet. Flight, yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Nick, you got the uh, next one? Yeah, so the next one's from Darren Smith. Um, Boeing offers new a casting couch oh, option no. for its new Dreamliners. <laughs> danger, danger, <laughs> danger. Not sure where he's going with that. Um, Matt, I think you have a special phrase for that. Ooh, one. Yeah. Uh, uh, family show, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, yes. Family show. Yeah. <laughs> Dave, you got the next one? Yeah, John Luke says that Carlos's last purchase of aircraft parts was one part too far. <laughs> Gemma's words still <laughs> ring in his ears. You made your bed. Lying. <laughs> well, quite. <yeah. laughs> oh, well, I, I would. That. Yeah, I would. absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Stephen uh, Stephen Hitchin says misunderstanding at Boeing as chief engineer announced that the bedding in bedding in period for new models is critical. <laughs> oh. We're back to the only fans again. Uh, Bill uh, Bill has said on the uh, on this one uh, in its ongoing attempt to get even more money. Ryanair has teamed with Airbnb. Shown above is the prototype cockpit suite. A Ryanair talking head stated, "We all we have all these planes sitting around at night. We might as well make some revenue. Blankets and breakfast are available." At a slight additional There's charge. an idea. <laughs> there's an idea for all those aircraft that are sitting around. I mean, there's a, Airbnbs. There's a, the small issue of, uh, of security, of course, because it's oh. the airside. Just saying. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh. um, Steve Tyre says, uh, someone check the bed adjustment switch cover is in place. <laughs> mm. uh, yes, you know what that can cause. It, well, yes, indeed. Chaos, I think, is the word. Uh, uh, <laughs> Do you want to take the last one from our local listener, Mazus, Nick? Yeah, um, good one from Mazus. Uh, Matt awoke to find he'd been the victim of another April 1st prank from oh, Carlos. Here we go. P.S. Parachutes under the pillow. Oh. <laughs> Very good, Mazus. That's all I have to say <laughs> to that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, a couple of ones in the in the chat room here. We'll whiz through these if we can. Uh, jump seat got an upgrade is one of them. Uh, Bill suggesting it was a flight simulator. Probably, I think that's if we're going to be uh, realistic about these things. Uh, Neil Lamorne is saying Boeing realised they have to really look after the FAA certification pilot after the latest door falls off. <laughs> uh, there we go. Uh, oh, Rick, Richard, uh, Richard E. Flag comes up with a with a stonking good one. There it says uh, you don't don't need to leave the ground to join the Mile High Club. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, <laughs> terrible. Very, very little sleeping going on there. Um, <laughs> Indeed, uh, there are there, there, there's a couple there uh, that I uh, <laughs> the one from Reese I can't read. I'm not going to. Uh, <laughs> there we go. Uh, there it says uh, family show, ladies and gentlemen. Family show. Uh, there we go. Yes, that <laughs> you got a terrible, honestly. You you miss us uh, so naughty, absolutely, absolutely. so naughty, indeed. Honestly, yeah. it's but all your uh, fault. Can't just uh, yes. I was going to yes. say, uh, just need to say to uh, Richard Flagg that it's technically the Five Mile High Club. Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very good. Accuracy, you know? Very good, Mr. Let's speak some more with experience. <laughs> Thanks for... Oh, hello. <laughs> anyway, dear, honestly. So don't forget, check out Where if you do don't you already... Where did Mrs. Nev meet, by the way? Just don't know. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, moving on. Uh, <laughs> oh, oh, you if you if you could have seen the look I just got there. <laughs> ah, gonna get, gonna get a, eighteen rating after the tonight. Yes, I know. Um, sorry. <laughs> thanks to everyone who's commented, and also don't forget to look out on our social media next uh, time for uh, the next caption. This just for fun picture because uh, yeah it'll probably I'm, I've yet to find it I'm going to search for something online so um, uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> Neil uh, sorry Rob uh, Lubbock is saying uh, last thought uh, last thing to see just before I see a picture in the cockpit there I'm off to bed night Fair enough. Well, <laughs> don't, fair enough. Don't blame you. Night, night, Rob. See you in the morning. <laughs> I tell you what. If I, I tell you what. If I if I didn't do if I didn't have this on my on my finger. Right. Okay. I I, I would so invest in a room like that. that would be, 
Right. <laughs> right. Okay. Probably just as well. Anyway. Probably just as well you are then, I think. I know. <laughs> and on that bombshell, we're going to start to bring the show to a close. Don't forget, uh, we have got our 500th show coming up very swiftly indeed. If you are one of our glorious listeners and you'd like to uh, send in some feedback for our 500th show make sure you send it in some audio feedback would be really really good if you could do that that'd be amazing uh, details and when to send that coming up in just a moment but we would love to hear from you perhaps you could tell us you know where you found out about us and uh, what you love about the show all that kind of stuff we'd love to hear from you in regards to that to play on our 500th show uh nev just for the benefit of those people who might not know where to send their feedback, where can they send it? Oh, yes. We can send feedback to podcast at plaintalkinguk.com uh, or to our WhatsApp number, plus 44 757 224 That's plus 44 757 224 And we're all on the socials, of course, as well. Facebook, Twitter or Instagram or LinkedIn. Just look for Plain Talking UK. And the website is www.plaintalkinguk.com. We've got our YouTube channel, of course, which a lot people are watching right now and you can uh, join us by uh, going to the chat room as well just go to uh, www.youtube.com and search for us at plain talking uk don't forget we've got uh, if you want to become a patreon of the show uh, or by paypal you can donate some money to us uh, if you're able to uh, and that is on our website so there's a link for that on the website so that's where we're going to bring episode 498 to a close of the show this week. Big thanks to everyone who's joined us in the chat room for the show tonight, watching live. Also, thanks to everyone who downloads the show each week as an audio podcast. We really do appreciate you doing that, guys and girls across the globe. Don't forget to tune in next week for another thrilling episode of the show. And, uh, yeah, have a great rest of the week. So from me, Carlos, here in the home studio, from Nev in his home studio from nick thanks nick for all your hard work this week in your studio at home and to matt as well in the master suite studio take care everyone and say goodbye nev see you take care bye bye Well done, everyone. Thank you for all the wow. hard work. And, yes, yeah, good. Well done. That's another wrap. Another one in 500th. the 500th. I can't believe we are... I know. Nearly there. Yeah, I know. It was actually wow. three shows, isn't it, to the 500th? Yeah, yeah. We've got uh, just a quick quick one for you still tuned in. We've got a very special show coming up just before the 500th, which uh, we uh, sorted out this week. A really, really, really good interview with uh, uh, a very... Well, very well to known pilot on social media. She is uh, an awesome pilot, flies to 320. So we've got that coming up um, just before the 500th. So make mm. sure we're, uh, you're watching on the old YouTube. Looking forward to that. Be on. Yeah, so that's uh, where we are going to go because uh, we're all tired. Nev is ready to nip off to his uh, queen size bed. Oh. And uh, <laughs> I know he's pushing the boat. How out. do you know? <laughs> I know these things. 
So, uh, so yeah, l uh, last words from you, Mr. Bounds, I think, to say goodbye to our lovely chat room. Yes, it's actually a super king, uh, in fact. Oh, quite right, so, absolutely. <laughs> I would have expected nothing less. <laughs> Well, thanks ever so much for joining everybody tonight. Really good to see everybody in the chat room again. And thank you for your fantastic contributions, especially for the caption competition. Really enjoyed that. Um, I'm doing some flying next week. So flying to Edinburgh on uh, Tuesday. We'll try out the, uh, the T5 uh, new scanners, see how we get on with that at the Heathrow. Meanwhile, I hope you have a great week and weekend. Uh, we'll see you next week, same time. Bye for now.